As we continue on with our discussion of friction in the labor market, let's take a look at the results of certain types of friction so that we can have some basis for understanding, some benchmarks, and some measurements that we can think of as we move on through the different segments of this module. So first, let's think about what these uh, these results of friction might be uh, might be starting with, or what might be uh, their determinants, what they might be forming from. First of all, we're going to think about a couple of different kinds of exogenous policy controls that might step into the market, and we'll think about those as wage floors and wage ceilings and labor quotas. These may create some friction in the market, and we'll see the effect of this friction not only graphically, uh, visually, but we'll also be able to quantify that in what's referred to as employer surplus and worker surplus and some value for deadweight loss. First, let's think about these wage floors and wage ceilings, possibly even labor quotas for a moment, and then we'll move to think about how we might measure them. So let's assume for a moment that we have our basically articulated labor market with a labor supply and a labor demand. We have some W star and some L star. It's pretty common to us at this point. Well, we know that in this market, if W star is low enough, so low that it's not acceptable in our economy, then there might be a policymaker or policymaking body that will set a minimum wage or a wage floor, a level below which we do not want the wage to fall, and we'll set that somewhere above W star. So let's say that we've got a wage floor, which we commonly think of as a minimum wage, but we're going to call it a wage floor. And it is a wage below which we do not want the market to fall. So it's always going to be above W star. There's no reason putting it at W star, or there's no reason for putting it below W star, because the endogenous supply and demand equilibrating influences of the market will keep it at W star. So we would only see a wage floor above W star. Similarly, there might be a situation in a marketplace where wages have risen too high. The equilibrium raise wage is too high. Maybe it's motivating some inflation that's un, unattractive for us or problematic for the market. So policymakers might actually put in place a wage ceiling instead of a wage floor, instead of allowing W star, a ceiling being a level above which we don't want the wage to rise. You can see very quickly then that these wage floors and wage ceilings may cause some friction or inequality in this market. We'll use wage floors as the example for a moment, such that if there's a wage floor above W star, given our existing labor supply and labor demand relationships, this is going to motivate some labor demand prime some labor supply prime, so labor demand and labor supply at the wage for the wage floor, such that labor supply is greater than labor demand, and we call that condition unemployment. And unemployment is cer certainly the result of some friction in a marketplace. Possibly that friction is a wage floor or minimum wage. Possibly not. There's many, many different reasons for it. And similarly, if we have a wage ceiling, we may have some shortage of labor in the market, which might even motivate a black market for, for this labor. So that's a little bit about wage ceilings and wage floors. A quota may have a similar effect in terms of creating some inequality. Labor supply, labor demand, labor, wage, and our equilibrium levels of W star and L star. And let's assume for a moment that we have some restrictive labor quota for some reason that enters this marketplace such that we have only LQ number of workers that can be hired, in which case we have a value difference here. The firms uh, at LQ number of workers may be able or may be thought to need to pay W plus labor or cost or wage, but in fact, the labor supply, the workers at LQ number of workers will only require W minus.
So the firms are getting some productivity based upon W+, plus, and they would have been willing to pay W+, plus, but they're only having to pay W- minus because at, that's where that quantity is transacting with the labor supply curve. So the workers are only going to be requiring W-, minus, and the firm's certainly not going to pay more than they're required to pay. So it creates an inequality or an imbalance in this market that yields some kind of a loss of surplus or loss of value as we move forward here. So let's think a little bit further about how we measure form and think about these surpluses, if you will. So here I've replicated my, my simple labor market model. And now I'm going to think about a couple of microeconomic uh, terms that you may be familiar with if you've had other microeconomics courses. And one of those would be consumer surplus. And one of those would be producer surplus. Well, if we think about it, the consumer of labor is the firm or the employer. And the producer of labor is the worker or the household. So we think about this in terms of employer surplus, or ES, and worker surplus as WS. And the sum of all the possible surpluses in our equilibrating market, one without friction being involved, would be the total surplus, which would be employer surplus plus worker surplus equaling total surplus. So let's think about what these surpluses might mean to us. Let's assume for a moment that there's a firm in this market and this is one of many firms in the market, which is which market is defined by this uh, graphic and these two equations for labor supply and demand. And this firm in the market only needs a certain number of workers. Let's say that it needs L prime number of workers. And so we very quickly see that it would expect to pay W prime for those workers. Similarly, there's another firm in the market that wants L double prime workers and would expect them to pay W double prime, and you can see that very quickly, if we wanted to, we could literally fill the entirety of our graphic here with these number of levels of workers and the wages that might arise from them. Well, if we think about it, this firm that needed L prime number of workers and expected to pay W prime, they don't have to pay W prime. In this large competitive market for workers, then firms are only going to be paying W star or 750 in this case. They may have been willing to pay much more based upon the number of workers they needed as it intersected the firm's labor demand curve. And even though I've represented this as a market, I'm supposing in this case that the firm has a similar labor demand curve as the market in general. That would make sense to us. Well, in this case, the firm doesn't have to pay W prime. They only pay W star. And the difference between W prime and W star is some benefit that they get to keep, some bargain they received, or some surplus that is theirs as a result of this transaction. And you can see that the surplus of one firm added to the surplus of another, 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 if we thought about this in the abstract, literally would fill the entirety of this triangle above W star, below the demand curve and bounded by the quantity. And that area, not coincidentally, is referred to then as employer surplus. Employer surplus. Well, we can tell the exact same story for the consumer of, uh, or, or that, that is the consumer of labor. We can tell the exact same story for the producer of labor or the worker in this case. So here we are. A worker that is going to supply their labor, let's say this is one unit of labor, it's going to supply their labor in the market, would expect to receive some W prime for their L prime labor, but in fact is going to receive W star. And the next worker is going to have the same experience, and the next, and the next, and so on, such that the sum of all of these experiences of all of these workers will go ahead and fill the entire triangle here below W star, above the labor supply curve and bounded by the quantity, such that we think of and we refer to this area as worker surplus. It is some bargain, bonus, or benefit surplus that the worker gets to retain given that they received W star for their labor 
even though they may have only been willing to receive a much lower wage based upon their intersection with the labor supply curve. So these are our surpluses. And you can easily see that as we change the labor supply curve, maybe it shifts in or shifts out or labor demand changes. Not only do we see changes in L star and W star, but we see changes in this employer surplus and this worker surplus. And we know that the total surpluses in the marketplace will be a sum of the employer and the worker surplus. And given that these are triangles, they are probably fairly simply measured or valued in terms of some price or dollar amount of wage times some quantity units, some base and height, then divided, uh, multiplied base and height, then divided by two to get you the area of this triangle. And that would give us a dollar value. And that would be the dollar value of employer or worker surplus. And again, these are virtually identical in structure and concept to consumer and producer surplus. Well, let's think a little bit about some of the policies, the disruptive policies in a market that might cause some friction that might result in some changes in these surplus values. So here I've identified uh, a a uh, employer surplus and I've identified worker surplus uh, as they might exist in this freely equilibrating marketplace. I've actually given some calculations. We'll take a look at how we calculate these in uh, in a moment. But I've, I've identified these, so let's think about now what kinds of policies might come into play that would motivate some of these disruptive uh, 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 exogenous influences in the marketplace to change these surplus values other than changes in labor supply and labor demand. And changes in labor supply and labor demand are not going to be disruptive. They're going to be endogenous. They're going to be organically or naturally occurring. So we, we think about those as changing the level of the surpluses, not disrupting the surpluses. And you'll see a little bit more clearly what I mean through that disruption in a few more, in a few moments. So think about this. Uh, a contract, maybe a labor contract with a firm and its workers. Maybe these are production workers. Uh, maybe they're, uh, maybe they're not, maybe they're, they're executives, but a contract that's in place might specify a certain number of workers or specify a certain wage. And if it specifies a certain wage, similar to maybe a wage floor or a wage ceiling, it's going to change some of the relationship here. Or maybe it's a union and some collective bargaining agreement that will have brought about this disruption. Maybe there is some exogenous influence uh, in the immigration market that changes this relationship. Or maybe there is some military personnel requirement that changes this relationship that's exogenous, that, that may not just change the labor supply, it changes the part of the labor supply that's able to be put into this private market for labor, and then there's more labor supply that goes into the public market for the military workers. So it's going to it's going to somehow shift this in such a way, either with a wage floor or a price floor, which is going to be a function of a contract or maybe a union or a legislative policy mechanism, or it's going to be changing the number of workers available uh, without changing the labor supply or even the labor demand curve. So let's think about how we might measure these. So here I've gone ahead and, and considered this particular, uh, this particular employer surplus and worker surplus, and let's calculate employer surplus for a moment. So we know that employer surplus is simply going to be the value of this triangle below the firm's labor demand curve, above the amount which the firm has to pay, and bounded by the quantity. So this is literally going to be a base times a height divided by 2. So the base, of course, is 12.5. And then we're going to multiply that by 20 minus 7.5. And then we'll divide that by 2. Well, why 20 minus 7.5? Well, 20 is the value at which the labor demand curve in, in intersects the, uh, the wage axis. And 7.5 is where this triangle then is going to stop. So the difference between these two values is the height of the triangle. And the base, of course, is the difference between L star and 0. So 12.5 times 20 minus 7.5. And that actually will end up equaling 12.5 times 12.5. Coincidentally, in this example, all of that divided by 2, which then will equal 
78.13. Worker surplus, we can then value somewhat similarly. We, we understand that there is a base of 12.5. And we're going to multiply that by some height. Well, the height this time is the difference between the equilibrium wage and what happens to be our reservation wage, or the the y-axis intercept of four and a third. So 7.5 minus 3.334. I think I said four and a third, but you recognized immediately that should have been three and one third. All of that divided by two, which simply will equal 12.5 times, I believe that is 4.17, divided by 2, and that's going to equal 26.06 then. So our employer surplus at 78.13, so that's the extra value bargain surplus employers receive because of this supply and demand relationship and the equilibrium wage. And then our worker surplus of 26.06, or $26.06, $78.13. And between them, those are all of the surpluses in this market. We've accounted for all of the quantity at W, or at L star, and all of the wage and wage disparities. And together, the employer surplus plus the worker surplus equals some total surplus, which in this case is 104.19.